All right. Well, I welcome everyone from various places throughout the, the Mid-Atlantic region and throughout the country. And I think we've got some international folks. So uh, we're so glad to have you all join us today for the webinar, Weddings, Wine and Wagon Rides, Land Use Issues and Agritourism. Uh, my name is Jared Anderson and I am part of the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration. The Mid-Atlantic Cl Planning Collaboration is a group of uh, APA chapters, uh, which include Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, the National Capital Area, West Virginia chapter, and also groups such as the Rural Planning Caucus of Virginia, the Maryland Department of Planning, the Maryland Planning Commissioners Association, and the WVU Land Use and Sustainable Development Law Clinic, which is what I, uh, where I hail from. So I, uh, without further ado, I uh, just wanted to let you know that the Planning Collaborative, the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaborative has done webinars for the past about a year or so. And the whole idea was to bring together our resources throughout the Mid-Atlantic region and to share our ideas, our planning ideas that resonate throughout the region. And so uh, one of the issues that came up um, pretty, pretty prevalent throughout our region and I'm sure across the country is agritourism. And so we have two very uh, distinguished uh, panelists that are going to take you through some of the land use issues that they encounter. And so we're just really happy to um, have them participate. I wanna give a special thank you to uh, the Virginia chapter of the APA for sort of hosting uh, this and, and sort of doing the, the logistics for the planning, uh, uh, for the planning uh, collaborative. And so um, a, a big shout out to them and to all of our uh, groups. So, uh, Without any further ado, I said that before, but um, I want to introduce both of our panelists. Uh, first, we have Kyle Shreve. Kyle is the executive director of the Virginia Agritours, Agri, Agribusiness Council, and he has lots of experience um, with, with dealing with land use issues, uh, especially in the Commonwealth, as it relates to agribusiness, agritourism. So we're very happy to have Kyle join us. And we also have Kevin Addix, the founder of Grow and Fortify in Maryland, who brings a wealth of experience um, dealing with issues that relate to planning, land use issues that uh, might be hot button issues that come up with agribusiness and agritourism. So I will kick it off and let Kyle and Kevin talk about agribusiness and agritourism. Thanks. Uh Thanks, Jared. I think uh, I'm first, um, so I'll I'll pull up my screen. Can everybody uh, see that on our? Uh -oh. I'm not seeing um, like your screen or anything. It's kind of it's just black for us. Interesting. Okay, hold on a second. There it is. Okay. All right. Uh, so thanks. As, as Jared said, I'm, I'm Kyle Shreve. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Virginia Agribusiness Council. Uh, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with our organization, uh, we are the trade association representing the ag forestry uh, industry. We go back to 1971, uh, representing the entire supply chain of agriculture, forestry, landscaping, turf grass, all the way down through. Essentially, if you plant anything or put anything in the ground uh, or raise livestock on top of it, we represent uh, you in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, and so it obviously is a very big uh, world in which we operate in, uh, but it also means that a lot of our producers, a lot of our members uh, have started to experiment more and more uh, with various types of agritourism, trying to bring people uh, particularly customers uh, and tourists to the farm uh, in an effort to uh, raise awareness, uh, create market uh, product uh, awareness, as well as get people just in general interested in rural Virginia again, uh, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, so just a little bit about what agritourism brings to the Commonwealth. Uh, this is from a, a 2017 Virginia Tech study, uh, and they estimated that 
agritourism in the Commonwealth of Virginia accounts for $2.2 billion in economic activity. Uh, now, just to give you an idea, uh, agriculture is uh, Virginia's number one private industry, about $71 billion of economic activity. Uh, tourism is number two, and forestry is number three, uh, right around 17 or 18 billion. And so all told, uh, we're, we're looking at about, with everything combined, uh, we represent an industry of about $91 billion in the Commonwealth of Virginia, supporting about 450,000 jobs, all told. Uh, agritourism supports about 22,000 jobs. Obviously, that's 2017 numbers. Uh, we think it has increased since then. Uh, in fact, Virginia Tech is looking at doing an updated study uh, at the, at the five-year point, so next year, uh, updating the numbers to see the growth. Uh, that obviously has been affected some uh, due to the pandemic and COVID-19 and the world we live in, uh, but it is definitely coming back as more and more of the agritourism activities are outside. Uh, and so a lot of our producers are reporting they're having a very good year as more and more people look to come back out uh, to the farm. It does offer uh, opportunities to get outside uh, with relative uh, easy social distancing. Uh, and 2017 study uh, said that Virginia uh, agritourism was responsible for $134.7 million in state and lo local tax revenue. Again, we think that's uh, it's a little more than that since then as we've expanded. Uh, but for the data we have, it's a very big deal in our commonwealth. We have a lot of diverse uh, diversity of operations, and this comes both regionally, the different types of agriculture that is practiced, uh, as well as uh, operations looking to diversify. And uh, so we've had more and more people try to expand uh, and more and more of our industry. Wineries, breweries, and cideries get a lot of the attention, uh, but we have an awful lot of pumpkin patches within our membership. Uh, Pick Your Own has become a very big deal in the uh, fruit and um, uh, produce uh, se selection. Uh, an awful lot of orchards up Northern Virginia, across the Piedmont. Uh, and as well, I mean, we've gone all the way down to uh, creameries in which uh, a couple of uh, the Homestead Creamery in Western Virginia, uh, Richland's Dairy, Southside uh, Virginia has started processing their own ice cream and milk products uh, for sale at retail. And so they have done an awful lot uh, using our AFID grant resources. We have an agriculture and forest products investment fund uh, grant program uh, that we've supported here in the state that is funded with Virginia uh, general fund dollars that uh, absolutely promotes and gives those startup dollars to agricultural industries uh, and, and uh, entrepreneurs uh, to start these type of businesses. And so it has become a very big priority uh, for the Commonwealth, for our economic development uh, areas and localities and trying to promote, especially in rural Virginia, uh, the areas uh, in which they can see economic growth, and that includes agritourism. Uh, a lot of wineries uh, and cideries up in Northern Virginia, Loudoun County, uh, stretching over to Clark, like I said, already all the way down through the Piedmont. A lot of breweries have pop popped up in Western and Southwestern Virginia, uh, as uh, those areas have been uh, very, very hard hit economically for these last five, six years with the, uh, and, and going back even 10 years, uh, with the uh, collapse of some of the coal country down there. Uh, and we have everything from distilleries over in Williamsburg. It, it really is a very, very diverse industry. And with it, that, that's created some very uh, exciting experimentation uh, and uh, areas of which they've tried to grow. Um, one other area I mentioned, and I know Kevin's going to talk about this some uh, later in Maryland, but uh, we have a very burgeoning horse industry. Uh, in Virginia, in which there's an awful lot of boarding, an awful lot of trail rides, uh, and uh, ways that we have tried to uh, incorporate the horse industry uh, into Virginia, and especially these last few years with the reopening of Colonial Downs in New Kent County, uh, our Thoroughbred Association and Equine Alliance uh, have very much promoted uh, Virginia horse and equine uh, and that has created a big revenue boost as well to the industry in the Commonwealth uh, through uh, through gaming uh, at Colonial Downs. So we are uh, we're particularly excited that our industry continues to uh, grow and adapt and improvise, especially uh, as a way to increase revenue at the farm and supplement the rest of the farm. Uh, however, that does lead to certain challenges, as you can imagine, and certain complaints about public safety. Uh, 
um, particularly with neighbors uh, and residents of localities complaining about things like noise, increased traffic, uh, parking, uh, especially on certain properties where uh, you have properties that are close uh, in the property line and cars uh, uh, spilling over into other people's properties. Um, alcohol has been a uh, uh, obviously a, a focus of uh, some of these agritourism entities with breweries, cideries, uh, and of course wineries, but uh, that also brings with the challenges of uh, increased uh, concern about overserving uh, and drunk driving. And we, we will get into that a little bit more here when we talk about some of the remedies that we've seen around the Commonwealth, uh, both at the uh, state level at our General Assembly uh, or in the uh, localities themselves. And then one other one that we have talked an awful lot about, we actually participated in a study uh, work group in 2018 is uh, building and fire code issues. Uh, in Virginia, uh, we have uh, an exemption for our farm buildings so that you don't have to build, uh, bring a barn up to code. Uh, and so as those spaces get converted uh, to event spaces, as new construction happens and builds in which you have uh, agricultural products being uh, turned uh, and, and processed and produced in the same space with which you are holding events, it has created a public safety concern. Uh, in, in certain localities. Uh, so just for your reference, I know there's a lot of definitions out there uh, throughout the country. Uh, in Virginia, agritourism activity is defined as any activity carried out on a farm or ranch that allows members of the general public for recreational, entertainment, or educational purposes to view or enjoy rural activities, including farming, wineries. You can see uh, the different examples on the screen. Uh, a Caveat to that, of course, is an activity is an agritourism activity, whether or not the participant paid uh, for it. And that's got us, uh, that, that's had increased scrutiny here recently with uh, things like ticketed events uh, on the farm. Uh, if you're bringing people out, uh, people enjoying live music, again, uh, going back to the, some of the noise issues we've had, uh, there has been some scrutiny around that. So it's a fairly broad definition. Uh, it's anything that brings people out, although you will notice uh, wine, while wineries are specifically included in there, uh, wedding, the word weddings is not. And so there have been a, a lot of discrepancies and arguments and debate in localities about whether a wedding uh, is defined as recreational entertainment or educational purposes. Some localities have flat out said, no, it isn't. It does not serve an agricultural purpose on the farm. Others have allowed them uh, on there. And that's where we get into some of these problems where uh, certain localities during zoning decisions, uh, especially when you're talking about new uh, wineries uh, or event spaces going in on, uh, at the farm level, uh, have started to question uh, whether or not those spaces are truly an agritourism activity uh, space. Uh, in our code of Virginia, no locality is allowed to regulate uh, the carrying out of any of the following activities at agricultural operations, and that includes agritourism activities. Again, uh, because weddings are not clearly defined, uh, localities have tried to get creative in the regulating of them through special use permits. I'll get into some of that later. But we do, the other big thing that we argue over quite a bit is unless there is a substantial impact on the health, safety, or general welfare of the public. Again, when alcohol is served, uh, a lot of the advocates on the other side that do not want the increased noise traffic or that venue to start to hold events, they argue that with the introduction of alcohol at the event, uh, it does pose a threat to health, safety, or general welfare. So you will see, even though I haven't seen any hard data that uh, it increases uh, over service or the increased uh, increases in drunk driving, uh, we have seen that argument play out in some of these zoning uh, decisions and, uh, and in hearings, uh, because that's how they make their justification for passing such an ordinance that would regulate uh, the building or the agritourism operation. So as I said, because we are a Dillon rule state uh, in Virginia, the General Assembly allows localities to regulate uh, businesses or raise revenue or any other uh, any other type of ordinance only as far as what the code will allow. And so uh, given the definitions of agritourism activities don't include certain events uh, or in the specific when it comes to things like weddings. And because there is that provision in there around uh, public health and safety, uh, 
we have seen uh, local ordinances introduced here in the past uh, two years, I, I'd say, uh, attempting to limit the number of events, uh, limit the size of the event, and limit the timing of events uh, in which they will uh, issue a permit uh, for a specific building or structure uh, in the application that would normally be uh, permitted by right. Uh, they have started to attempt to uh, regulate the actual building of that space for agritourism uh, with caveats around it. You are allowed to use it uh, and you will allow you to build it. However, as a condition of your permit, uh, you have to get, uh, you can only have 12 events per year. Uh, you can only have 12 events per year of 250 people or more. Uh, and you can only do it at certain weekends of the year, which obviously poses a problem. Uh, and, and certain constraints around the viability of that project, how much revenue and operation is eligible for. Um, and if certainly the timing of events uh, becomes a big problem if they try to limit traffic at a, at a holiday weekend, uh, say July 4th uh, or Labor Day weekend as we just uh, went through, uh, that certainly poses a, a, a serious cap on revenue, uh, making the, the venture uh, that much more untenable uh, and much riskier if you're going to start holding events on, on farms. Uh, as I mentioned, the other thing that we have talked about and discussed quite a bit here in Virginia is, is that we do have a farm building exemption uh, from our building code. And so a farm building or structure uh, is a uh, not building not used for residential uh, purposes located on property where farming operations take place. And that includes any storage, handling, production, uh, display sampling or sale of agricultural, horticultural, floricultural, silvicultural products. Uh, that obviously includes uh, any agricultural products like uh, uh, wine or spirits. Uh, and so a lot of our, uh, if you use that building for sampling of the wine you produce uh, off the farm, uh, then you are exempt from the building code. This is where we get uh, uh, some of our, our problems. The other thing is we do have uh, a, a number of barns that will store uh, horses, you know, two or three horses through the year, uh, through the week, uh, and then they move the horses to another uh, location for one day for an event, and then move the horses back in. And so obviously this creates a uh, pretty big uh, uh, loophole uh, in which uh, some bad actors can uh, come in and put the entire exemption at risk. Now, this is where it gets complicated and gets incredibly tricky, which we've had public safety advocates argue that if you have any members of the general public in there at all, uh, it should be put up fully on to the building code. Uh, however, uh, as I said before, uh, we had a, a, there were members that like to hold old fashioned barn dances uh, in, their, in their barn uh, uh, and they only do it uh, once a month or once every other month, depending on the weather. Uh, in which they move their livestock out. Now, every other day of the month, uh, it's used to house their livestock. Uh, however, they would have to cancel that event uh, or not hold, host it if, the, uh, if they had to put it up to, to building code. Uh, the other big problem that we have throughout this is uh, the idea of mixed use buildings in which the uh, product is processed in that building, it is bottled in that building, and then of course it is sampled in that building. And so it's very difficult in a mixed use code section to bring everything up to building code. And we've seen estimates and had estimates done in which you're talking about 350 to $500,000 worth of renovations. Uh, that puts the business out of business or forces them to not host events or bring members of the general public uh, on their property at all. And so threading the needle and trying to figure out where exactly that line is between public safety and, uh, and allowing the business to operate and host events uh, has become quite complicated. And uh, certainly we encourage building up the code if you know you're gonna primarily host it, uh, events on there for any new construction and, and uh, every, mem every member I've ever talked to have done so. Um, however, there are things we can do uh, that at least uh, keep the public and members of uh, the general population that do come out uh, safe uh, while also being uh, cost effective for the producer. Uh, so the winery industry here in Virginia put together building safety best practices, things like exit lighting uh, and uh, exit signs, 
uh, doors that push out, uh, having a public safety plan, uh, lighted exits, fire extinguishers uh, in multiple fire extinguishers, depending on the size of the space. Uh, and certainly if a kitchen is present in which you're cooking food. Um, the, one of the things we have advised our members and we have, we're, we, this has been very, very good over the last five years or so is that be proactive in reaching out to local public safety officials and, and bring them into the process early. Um, make sure you have wide enough uh, areas in uh, driveways, parking spaces. If there were an emergency, can emergency services personnel uh, get at your, get to the farm? Is there enough space for uh, an ambulance to get through, for example, if you had to call first responders? Uh, make your locality aware when you're having an event so they can help with traffic. We, we have a lot of our uh, members that will work with their locality and their local sheriff's department to help manage traffic uh, and at least, uh, or will pay their own private uh, to stop traffic uh, and deal with the excess uh, members. Um, have enough staff or volunteers to, to deal with that uh, makes those problems a lot more uh, uh, manageable. Uh, and also it, it's much appreciated by your neighbors uh, who may or may not uh, appreciate having the increased uh, foot traffic or noise uh, on the property. That's the other thing, be, be careful with uh, your members depending on where you're locating that event space or which spaces you're having events at. Uh, and so you know, obviously if, if you're in a more residential neighborhood and hosting an event uh, or even a, a more rural event, uh, one of your neighbors, we do get a lot of complaints from uh, other farms that we have on rural areas that if you're having an event and uh, is making a lot of noise in which your neighbor may host uh, house livestock, uh, then make sure you're taking the proper precautions and, and not going all evening. Uh, you know, set your hours accordingly, uh, depending on your, your neighbors. Um, we have an awful lot of, re we're very lucky in Virginia to have an awful lot of resources at the disposal of our members. Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, has a, an agent that, that uh, specializes in agritourism uh, and puts out a lot of information regarding uh, what others are doing, what issues you're seeing. Uh, the other thing is we have a, a uh, individual responsible for agritourism outreach at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, uh, with which uh, we work very regularly with to uh, disperse information. Uh, they help uh, with the program putting on. We, we do an annual agritourism conference in Virginia uh, in which producers uh, get together that are engaging in agritourism in order to discuss best practices, issues they're facing. Um, we do generally oppose ordinances that unnecessarily or arbitrarily ban events and limit the amount of revenue an agritourism uh, operation can make. Uh, as I've said, we we definitely like the more collaborative approach rather than just arbitrarily limiting which event uh, days you can have uh, or setting limits on uh, the number of events an operation can have. Um, we have seen more and more ordinances. Uh, Fairfax County, for example, uh, recently passed an ordinance that limits the amount of people you can have on your farm uh, or, or property, depending on the size of the property. So it's a certain percentage uh, of the square footage, you're allowed to have up to uh, so many people at the event. Um, I know Fairfax County, there's not a whole lot of operations left, but there are some, uh, definitely. There's definitely wineries uh, and breweries left. And so putting an ar arbitrary number on there, you know, a certain percentage does give a, a head fake depending on the size of your operation to uh, certain levels of uh, uh, reasonableness when it comes to how many people, um, but we want to make sure we're not putting a, a limit or, or overtaxing our members because that decreases the likelihood that uh, agritourism is going to be viable economically. And if you take away that revenue stream, uh, that becomes a serious problem uh, for Virginia uh, and our agritourism operations. Uh, we are seeing an awful lot of just flat out agricultural production uh, operations start in on agritourism in order to supplement the farm, none, uh, none more than our dairy industry. Uh, Virginia's dairy industry has lost 25% of our operations over so the last two and a half years uh, and climbing. Uh, it is just increasingly hard to operate a dairy farm in Virginia and they are looking for any type of revenue they can get uh, in order to supplement and keep that operation going. And so those stories are incredibly important. Uh, when we've talked about, we have seen a number of bills at the General Assembly level 
uh, to try to get a handle on this. We haven't uh, passed anything yet, um, but there was a bill a few years ago to include weddings and agritourism activity uh, definition in order to be more specific because uh, Virginia Beach's ordinance does specifically say that weddings are not included. Um, and we have, uh, and that, that bill was soundly defeated. It became very controversial among public safety advocates, the industry, and, uh, and members themselves all the way down the line uh, about what is and what is not included in agritourism. Uh, so it's important to be very uh, careful when you're starting this to make sure you know uh, what the state laws are, what your local ordinances require, and try to be as proactive as possible in starting your operation, especially uh, given what type of operation you're uh, uh, having, uh, who you're bringing out to the farm, and, and for what type of events. Uh, with that, I know uh, Kevin's got a, a long run of all in Maryland. I'm happy to answer any questions about what we've seen in Virginia. Uh, my email address is up there. If anybody is seeing anything, we, we certainly appreciate the heads up or like discussing what people are seeing in, in, in Virginia or in our surrounding uh, states, because oftentimes uh, what we see in other states uh, tends to uh, pop up here. Uh, so uh, certainly look forward to the rest of the discussion and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jared. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. And Jared, do you want to jump no, in? Go, yeah, you go, go ahead and take it away. Great, so I am uh, filling in before my presentation uh, on behalf of Shelby Hampton, uh, Watson Hampton, who um, decided to, to uh, have a baby today, which is a, a great thing for her. So congratulations um, on, uh, on that. So uh, let me jump in. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So Shelby was going to talk about uh, farm stays specifically, and then I will jump to my presentation hereafter about um, uh, some of the regulatory issues that we've had broadly, uh, just a lot of it to reiterate what um, Kyle had stated. But farm stays is something that it, it's, a, it's a unique example of um, a, a deep singular example of the overall concerns and issues that, that uh, we face with agritourism. So first of all, if you're not familiar with what um, farm stays are, it is essentially a farm opening itself up to uh, campers either in camping gear or RVs or opening up their um, buildings for Airbnbs. And you know, one of the biggest questions to start off is what, what does uh, this have to do with agriculture? And um, you, you, have to, you have to think broadly about it. Um, so is it farming? No. Does it support farming? 100%. Um, does it help the farmers in kind of a, a, a broader, more abstract way of introducing people to agriculture? Certainly. Um, so it's revenue to the farm, but it also promotes the concept of agriculture, because you have to keep in mind that most Americans do not live on or near farms any longer. So um, this could be their, their interaction. The three main um, sources of these campers uh, that Shelby was going to talk about are Airbnb, Hip Camp, and Harvest Hosts. So Airbnb is the first. Most folks are familiar with Airbnb. It's, it's essentially a platform. And it's a platform that allows uh, originally people uh, to rent rooms on a nightly, uh, daily basis, but it has um, grown into more than that. People can, you know, customers can reserve uh, accommodations, but also uh, attractions and uh, tickets and other things via Airbnb. So it's really about experiencing and people getting out on the road and experiencing. So that's one option. Hip Camp is uh, the go-to site for tent campers. So people who, um, you know, don't need all the modern conveniences can reserve via hip camp or, or see via hip camp who is available and where is available and can jump in. And um, these can be uh, via parks, cabins, tree houses, you know, essentially anywhere. Harvest hosts is, is primarily uh, driven by RV customers. So, so individuals who own RVs and are interested in places to stay overnight, camp, park overnight. Um, 
there are in any of these circumstances no necess no um, guarantees uh, or or um, uh, offerings from the host other than space. Just come here, set up. Uh, hopefully, enjoy the farm. Um, it could be combined with you know a farm stay where they're helping to work on the farm, or they're coming to a place that has a market. Um, you know, Kyle men mentioned. Um, you know, farmers markets all the way down through wineries, breweries, distilleries, creameries, you know, pumpkin patches on and on and on. So hopefully they're here in season and hopefully they're also while they're staying buying some products. So you see two photos here of what this could look like. It could be um, truly just a spot in a field or, or in a forest on a farm, um, or it could be a little more managed and maintained in terms of the accommodations once uh, arriving. Farmers like it because it's a great additional resource to the farm. And, um, you know, I, I always talk about farmers in terms of there are two types of farmers, um, the, the old style farmer and the new style farmer. The old style farmer uh, farmed large, large acreage, um, did not interact with the public, and really wanted nothing to do with selling uh, products. They sold commodities. You know, they looked at the grain price and they sold the grain for whatever that price is. Um, the new farmer is looking for any avenue they can to interact with people, um, interact with uh, customers of all types, whether that's wholesale, retail, or direct market, and um, any way to promote their product and the concept of farming. Um, with that, agritourism has obviously been on the rise in every state. Uh, we, um, uh, over the border in Maryland, looked to Virginia as the place that um, largely figured it out first on the East Coast, um, some points in, in, or some places in New York as well, but Virginia with the rules and, and the fact that it's a, a Dillon state and, um, you know, the, the rules really do, or the structure um, uh, aids these businesses in getting started, uh, much more so in, in states like in Maryland. Um, Maryland's Farm Bureau has promoted uh, Hip Camp as way as a way to try to get people to interact with farms. I won't read these, but here are some things that that um, farmers are saying. Um, uh, most notably, that it's generated passive income and it's helped to promote farms, which you know the opportunities to do so are few and far between. Obviously, the challenges are the same as. A lot of things that, that uh, Kyle referenced and that I'll uh, point out in my slide deck. Um, zoning and permitting is the big thing. What are these things? You know, if, if you are, is it, is it a use? Is it a classification? Is it a subordinate use? Is it, um, you know, how, how can planning, zoning, permitting fit campers coming to a farm into code? Um, and I'll use the example now and talk about it a little bit later as well. Um, Planning and zoning and permitting very often hear that someone is camping on a property and they want to apply campground regulations and rules and classifications to that property. And um, it's often a mismatch because these, uh, you know, the RV is coming in or someone coming in in a tent, um, you know, th they're fine with porta pots or something a little more gourmet, a compostable toilet or you know, the RVs are generally self-contained and don't need anything. Um, so that's in direct conflict with I'm on a farm, but now the county or, or state is requiring me to put in multiple sets of his and hers bathrooms or a brand new septic or a new well to service you know, these potential um, uh, clients and customers. So you know, another question is seasonal versus year round um, and what makes something a campground um, is it frequency of use uh, or, or is, are there are there certain conditions? And then of course, occupancy is always a concern. So we have a statewide definition for agritourism in Maryland and uh, questions are arising because when each of these new things like farm stays and hip camp and, and, and these types of models come up and they're not in a static definition that was passed numerous years ago before anyone thought um, during a pandemic, I just wanna go camp on a farm, which it's happened a lot. So how do we adjust our rules and regulations and or make them broad enough so that all these things can fall in? 
And we're looking for um, more unified approaches rather than individual jurisdictional approaches to uh, how to deal with these things, because right now each jurisdiction is coming up with, as they're allowed to, uh, very different concepts and, and impressions about how they're going to regulate these businesses. And so we, we are always looking for a more unified way of doing it. Um, and with that, I'll take my Shelby hat off and uh, jump to the next presentation. And thank you for your patience as I migrate over to the next slide deck. So agritourism interpretations and, and misconceptions. Um, first, very briefly about what we do. Um, our, our group represents uh, businesses and the organizations who support them. So we represent, for example, the Wineries Association, Distillers Guild, Hemp Coalition, uh, Brewers Association in the state. And so we're supporting those individual businesses, but also the organizations through marketing events, um, government affairs, and a whole lot of work at the county level. This led us to an economic analysis uh, in 2000, which um, showed that agritourism has become an incredibly huge, impactful part of Maryland's economy. And every state um, that has agritourism can do this math and we're happy to share our report. Um, and, and it can, I'm sure, easily be extrapolated, but everything from uh, horse stables to forestry to nursery animals, dairy, poultry, um, seafood and aquaculture, obviously the craft beverages, all the way down to the pumpkin patch, you pick farms, and of course, value added agriculture uh, and, and uh, uh, broadly can mean uh, growing organically, right? It's, it's taking any farming process and amping up the value of it through either a, a physical transformation of fruit into jam or grapes into wine, um, or it could be marketing and, and promotion as a way to value add products. So um, please take a look at this. Um, you just see that the, the numbers are staggering. $875 million directly to the state's economy 20.6 billion in uh, economic impact. So that includes, you know, not just our businesses, but um, uh, hotel stays and, and you know, the, the tips for wages uh, for people who are serving them dinner at restaurants and all of those things. So a lot of jobs as well. Very quickly, some reasons we want to support agritourism. Um, it, it's, and I'll start with agricultural preservation because it keeps farms farming. And that's becoming increasingly difficult to do in uh, states like Maryland where there's such development pressure, land values are going up, um, farms are being subdivided. But when you preserve agriculture, you can keep people on those farms and skilled jobs. You can make those farms profitable, um, lots of tax revenue to the state, support for other farmers because once you have a thriving market, you're buying other local products or allowing other local farmers to sell those products through your um, tasting room, tap room, farm market, um, you know, you pick farm fairs, whatever it is. Incredible economic development. Tourism, I can't um, overstate how important tourism is uh, to states because the good thing about tourism is you don't have to build schools to support the people who are tourists, right? You don't have to, to, to build out that infrastructure. They come in, they spend their money and they go home which is great. And of course, quality of life. The communities surrounding farms are looking for things to do and ways to educate and experience with their families and farms have become a great way to do that. Maryland has a couple of laws that help guide uh, agritourism. First is we've got a model definition of agritourism. Now in Maryland, it's a model definition. So counties may or may not adopt that language, may or may not point to it, may or may not consider it. We've got uh, a farm alcohol producer model language, same thing. It exists in the state uh, land use code and counties have the option of whether to make use of it. We also have an agritourism building code exemption uh, for capacity up to 250 people. And that's in certain, certain jurisdictions. So the jurisdictions have to add their name into this list. Um, and what that does is it exempts that building used for agritourism from uh, uh, all the building code um, they, and by saying that it still has to be, you know, as improvements are made, they still have to be to code, 
but sprinklers are not required um, and uh, elevators are not required. Those are the two uh, big things because we've got a lot of beautiful barns and bank barns and other things. Ingress and egress still needs to be met. Um, sprinklers do not need to be met. Um, so we can, I can point you to that if anybody's interested in it. Um, it's worked very well in the counties that have adopted it. Industry's most obvious challenges um, have been that uh, the specific use is not classified or delineated in code. So um, unless your code has been updated in the last two years, farm camping is probably not in there. Um, and there are a lot of things that happen on these agritourism farms that are not specifically delineated in code. If it's in a uh, uh, positive, generous county where they want to encourage these things, and we've got them in Maryland, some very great counties, then that's okay because they can say, this is close enough to this use, we'll put you there. But if you're not in one of those counties, um, very often your answer can be no when you ask to start these things up. Um, we find that many jurisdictions are relying on old concepts uh, and assumptions. So they're, they're remembering what a winery looked like in 1980, the last time that planning or zoning or permitting official um, engaged with the industry. And that's not obviously how things have evolved. General misconception of the actual use or activity. Uh, so we have certain jurisdictions where a winery tasting room Every time a new winery is licensed, we have the discussion, is it commercial, is it not commercial? Um, they're selling things, so obviously it's commercial, but so is a farm stand, yet you're not treating them as being commercial. So trying to figure out how things apply. Um, we have noticed in some jurisdictions an incredible lack of desire uh, among regulatory staff to help get this business open and operating. And I understand that that's not the role of a regulatory department. In fact, the role is to make sure that certain very specific things are being complied with. And while I understand that and appreciate that, um, times have changed. And we're at a point with a lot of these industries where if everybody is not aiming toward trying to get these businesses open, working with the economic development department, or more likely the economic development department working with the permitting department to try to connect, you know, dotted lines and turn them into so solid lines in terms of how to get from A to B. And then a real lack of flexibility of interpretation, which I understand why you make it an exemption or an exception for somebody. And, you know, ostensibly you need to do that for everybody. But, you know, we, we very often find that these places live in gray areas and we're trying to find ways to get it done. Here's an example of a winery, um, multiple experiences with wineries when they walk into their local planning zoning permitting office and say, all right, I wanna be a winery. Well, what does that mean? Well, I wanna grow ingredients. Well, that's great, you're a farmer. I wanna make cider, beer, wine, spirits. Oh, well, you're a manufacturer now. And if you start thinking as you're going down this list, you know, if you are in the planning department, farming can be done in certain zones. Manufacturing can be done in certain very different zones. So can you manufacture on a farm? Can you have a liquor store on a farm? Can you have a bar on a farm? Can you have a restaurant on a farm? Um, we certainly wouldn't allow a Walmart on a farm. Um, so if you're selling other people's products, you know, maybe with your logo or brand on it, corkscrews, t-shirts, glassware, whatever, um, now you're a retailer. Now you're, you're in some zoning department's minds, you're very, you're off the reservation, as they say. Um, I want to store product. You're a storage company. Um, I want to ship product. Well, your road doesn't allow for shipping, receiving, all of that. So, and then of course, events. This, we, we, this is kind of the same conversation we have, not just with wineries, but with just about every type of value-added agricultural, especially agritourism business, trying to, trying to, I hate the word convince, but work with a local uh, agency to, to ensure that these things are appropriately allowed um, through interpretation, right, through their impressions, their assumptions on this farm property. Uh, Kyle referenced these um, top flashpoints, and these occur in every discussion. Um, whether or not these are, are real issues, there have been enough issues uh, that have either been kind of unenforced or, or unregulated that um, 
neighbors have legitimate concerns about noise, smells, traffic, parking, um, agriculture versus commercial activity, right? I moved next to a farm yet here they are doing X, Y, Z. Um, did the use change? Um, what's an event and how many can be held? Is a wedding an event? Is a car show at a farm brewery an event? Is a beer release on a Thursday night an event? Septic comes up all the time because all of these uses um, not only have the uh, potential engagement with customers and if you're feeding and, and drinking with customers uh, or consuming with customers, then there's uh, ostensibly going to need to be restrooms. And then how many restrooms and how big and where and, and does the site allow it? And very often these are um, from a development standpoint, they're compromised parcels. Um, uh, so we have those things to, to uh, uh, try to get through. Flexibility. Um, we always seek, and I am always the first one to say this in meetings, we're not looking for, we're not looking to break the law or get around rules. We're trying to figure out if you, the planning, zoning, permitting uh, departments, are willing to look at uh, the final goal and what the building code and what the planning law says need to be done. And uh, perhaps to break with convention to get us there. So finding a way to get from A to B. Um, these industries require being willing to think and work outside the box. Um, I can point to counties in Maryland who are unwilling to think and work outside the box. And they have either zero or very few of these agritours and businesses because the county can't find a way to make it work. Whereas the jurisdiction right next door, because the county executive or the county council or the director of economic development or tourism are educating all the staff there, they love it, they want it, they're seeking it out. Um, and of course, you know, when, when you hit a, a blockade, um, keep in mind that, that the individuals, the new businesses that you're dealing with can't just find another building, right? This is their farm. Um, they potentially have owned it for many years or they just purchased it and are getting into farming, but we need to find a way to allow them to do what they're trying to do on this farm. And it will take sometimes, in the, even in the best case scenarios, unconventional thinking. In the worst case scenarios, um, exceptions and exemptions. Some examples, um, we've had a cidery uh, get approved in a floodplain. Obviously septic isn't gonna work out. Uh, so they were allowed by the local environment uh, permitting folks have an above ground holding tank to take their sewage and their wastewater and that was pumped on a regular basis. Obviously an extreme example, but they were in a floodplain uh, re regularly flooding. It was an old mill. So it was, you know, built for flooding. It, it literally had a, a stream running through it, which at times would flood. A winery on land uh, without room for a new septic. Um, so they were allowed, they were allowed to install incinerating toilets. Um, probably not the first or, or you know, first choice or, or best choice maybe, but in that instance, we require people to be able to go to the bathroom, right? That we're trying to get from no bathroom to bathroom. And so this was a way that that jurisdiction allowed that to happen. Historic barns that can't meet for a variety of reasons, can't meet building code, um, and were allowed by the local fire marshal to uh, coat the wood with you know, some kind of material that increased the burn time. Because at the end of the day, the goal is to slow that burn as much so that someone can get out of there. So obviously increase their ingress, egress, you know, doors and, and other uh, ways out. But do other things, add drywall, so something that, you know, fire retardant drywall, something that will increase the burn time. That's the goal, right? So let's find a way to get there uh, because sprinklers just were impractical. Um, a tough example, uh, we've had a, a brewery that applied for uh, their uh, planning permitting to be considered essentially because brewery wasn't necessarily in the code um, we want to be treated like a tavern. People will be eating and drinking here. And unfortunately, the interpretation at the local level was, oh, well, I know what a brewery is. We'll treat you like a brewery. We know you'll have a, a tasting room. But they neglected to consider fully that 
um, you know, a, a, a tavern as they were being, uh, or as they were applying for, will be consuming and, and people will be potentially drinking um, uh, and potentially eating via food truck or, or whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, a year in, the jurisdiction was very concerned. Oh my gosh, look at this activity that's happening here that we didn't anticipate. Yet the brewery anticipated it and applied with that in mind. So that's something to consider. And then um, finally, seasonal UPIC operations that were told to cancel school tours because that county decided that porta pots were not sufficient for that extremely temporary seasonal use. And so um, the UPIC essentially was shut down. Um, again, briefly, how to improve. Um, obviously, definitions and clarity help, right? Anything that a jurisdiction can do to Im improve clarity while understanding that you can't be too specific because we in our agritourism list have a whole bunch of things that I don't think have ever been done in Maryland, or at least not in recent history, because it was an old definition that was modified and improved a little bit, but it's not future proof. So there are a lot of things that are not on there that are occurring and things that are on there that no longer occur. Frederick County, Maryland um, has an incredible startup guide for craft alcohol producers for on-farm and off-farm. Um, develop those guides and, and make it easy so when someone comes in and says, I wanna start doing this, you have a guide for that. It doesn't answer all of their questions, but it tells them the basics and it tells them what to expect and who to talk to. Um, hire and designate ombudsmen, uh, ombudsmen, women, um, to guide and support startups. This usually happens in the economic development or tourism office where it's somebody who uh, can go to local planning and zoning and say, hey, we're having trouble understanding this or why this is required and would you consider these alternatives? And then cut through the process um, or the politics and the special interest. We really want these things to grow. So I will leave it there. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Okay, uh, well, it looks like we have one question and I'll, I'll go ahead and read it and then Kevin or Kyle, feel free to, to jump in. And the question is, are you seeing that any localities as part of a special use permit or conditional use permit approval conditions for wedding venues are recommending limits to the hours of operation? Do you have any recommended hours of operation? In my locality, city council has routinely established a limit of midnight, and it has frustrated many owners of these businesses. So for Virginia, we have seen the ordinance as, as a condition of these properties. And it's not just for, it's, it's basically any events held on an agritourism space or, or wedding events. We've seen them put uh, time limits on or, or up to a certain hours for, for noise, uh, specifically events with live music or a DJ, something like that, where, you know, they'll say 11, 1130, you know, they have to shut it down by, by a certain time. And, and they vary depending on the locality. Um, I haven't seen any specifically about hours of operation for an agritourism venue or weddings, but most of those, most of the weddings, right, are going to be dependent on music or, or a concert or whatever so that effectively shuts them down um, some just make them so that there is no exemption for those operations on any and we do have some old ordinances for specific specifically within like certain town limits right municipalities that have noise ordinances up to a certain point so uh, nothing specific to hours of operation you have to shut down but uh, certainly uh, they usually do it via noise uh, where you that type of event would have to shut down if you're offering live music. And, and it's a lot of the same in Maryland where um, most agritourism uses are considered farming and farming does not have hours tied to it. Um, for the more established uh, uses where the grooves have been run, craft alcohol producers, for example, many of them in their state licenses have hours of operation for the public side, not for the manufacturing side, you can make beer all night long, but you know, or cream or whatever it is. But um, if, if you are engaging with the public, there tend to be hours in the state statute. And in many jurisdictions, there are hours. And again, the hours are, are tied to uh, the act. The reason the hours are there is for noise traffic 
right? Parking, those kind of things. So um, many of our jurisdictions uh, run until 10 o'clock. There are some that run until nine. There are some that say you can operate till 10, but live music turns off at eight. So local jurisdictions have the flexibility to do that in, in Maryland. Are there any other questions of our presenters? I'll give folks a second to type up any questions that they might have, last second questions, lingering questions. Uh, if not, um, the Mid-Atlantic Planning collabor Collaboration really appreciates everyone attending, really appreciates our, our panelists, Kyle and Kevin, for attending, and Shelby, who uh, <laughs> has a very good excuse for, for not being able to attend today, and wish her the best. Um, if you have any other questions or concerns or uh, want to know more about the, the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration, uh, we, we invite uh, folks to submit ideas uh, for future topics. We, um, if you want to hear more from Kevin and Kyle and maybe Shelby on the other side of things, uh, we would, I, I think that we would be open to that as well. We, we kind of just did scratching the surface. Um, I think that uh, both of our presenters could go, go into a, a deeper dive if you all uh, want to. And we, I think we would be happy as a collaboration to, to consider that. We're always looking to, to, to make sure that we provide content that helps our planners. So, um, and we got a thank you from New Zealand. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. That technology is 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 great. So um, I don't know uh, if Kyle or Kevin, you guys have any parting words. Nope. I appreciate uh, you having uh, having me. I uh, enjoyed it. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you all. Bye.